ever been introduced to someone new and then thought, they seem nice enough, but I really don't know much about them, let alone what they're really like. <clears throat> Our first reading from the Book of Sarah tells us that we shouldn't praise or follow anyone until we know what sort of person they really are, and that we should examine, inspect, and test those around us. Basically, it's saying we need to do our homework to try to determine the character of others. The reading tells us that each person's words, their speech, how they interact with us, how they communicate with us during a regular conversation, will help us to better understand that person's character. The reading also says that the true test of a person is during a period of tribulation. When someone is suffering hardship, difficulty, stress, illness, how do they act? Are they lashing out at the whole world because it seems like the whole world is against them? Or are they enduring the period of suffering and trying to use it as a way to grow closer to God. The full test of a person takes an entire cycle. What they say and how they act during the good times, the everyday times, as well as the difficult times. The reading from Luke's Gospel takes this testing further by moving the focus from those around us to us. Mind you, Jesus isn't saying that we should move the focus specifically to us or only to us. It's like if you meet someone new, you might point at them and think, I need to find out more about them. And the reading from Sarah agrees that we need to examine the person that our finger is pointing at. But Jesus is reminding us that while one finger is pointing at somebody else, I've got three fingers that are pointing back at me. <clears throat> our words, our speech, our actions are indicators to others of what's in our hearts. This change in focus from others to ourselves is significant. Why? Because we can't direct or control the actions of others, but we are responsible for our own actions. In Jesus' parable from Luke, the wood that he talks about, the splinter and the wooden beam, represent sin. They represent our faults, our weaknesses, our imperfections. <clears throat> Why does Jesus speak of one being a tiny splinter while the other being a huge would mean? Is he telling us that our sins and our weaknesses are so much larger than others? <clears throat> our wooden beam is more significant, but only in that we are responsible for it. Jesus is simply pointing out how much easier it is for us to find faults in others. How much easier it is to try to see a tiny imperfection in someone else. We tend to see clearly when examining others, but have severe difficulty admitting to faults in ourselves. Notice that I said we have severe difficulty admitting to faults, not finding faults. I think if we're honest with ourselves, deep inside, we really know where faults are. Our human faults, our human weaknesses, cause us to be drawn to sin drawn by temptation, greed, corruption, meaning that we are capable of being corrupted, capable of dishonest practices, capable of times when we're lacking in integrity. You may be thinking, since being human makes us more susceptible to sin, and as we heard the reading from St. Paul to the Corinthians, sin is the sting of death. Is everlasting life even possible? St. Paul tells us, when this, which is corruptible, when our bodies, our very beings, which are corruptible, clothes itself with the incorruptibility, 
and this, which is mortal, clothes itself with immortality. We can overcome our faults. We can overcome our weaknesses. What is the incorruptible? What is the immortal? There's only one. That's Jesus. When we wrap ourselves in him, allow him into our hearts, allow Jesus to make a radical change to our very beings, we're strengthened against the power of evil, bolstered against the draw of temptation. And it's in this way that we have the opportunity for everlasting life with Jesus in heaven. The opportunity to have victory over death itself. When we allow Jesus fully into our hearts, allow him fully into our lives, we begin to realize that all we have and all we are are gifts from God. Everything we normally think of as a gift, our friends, our families, our homes, our jobs, our health, they're all gifts from God. But also, our hardships, our difficulties, any suffering we might endure are also gifts from God. I realize that thinking of and trying to understand pain and difficulty as a gift is hard. But it's through these times, through these things, that we're able to better relate to the suffering and pain that Jesus endured on the cross for us. It's during that, these times that it's easier for us to draw closer to God. Easier for us to improve our relationship with Him. When things are going well, we tend to forget about God. We tend to put things on autopilot. And it sometimes takes difficulty and suffering to bring God back into focus for us. St. Paul urges us to be firm, steadfast, always fully devoted to the work of the Lord. Jesus tells us in Luke's Gospel that every disciple, when fully trained, will be like his teacher. Our teacher is Jesus. Our goal should be to complete our training so that in our words, our thoughts, our actions, our hearts, our character, during the very best of times, during the very worst of times, and everywhere in between, when we encounter somebody else, they don't see us, but rather they see Jesus in us. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. Yes, Lent is upon us. Lent's a time for prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. A time for reflection. A time to perform on our own lives, our own beings, the sort of examination and inspection that the reading spoke about this morning. Lent's a great time to identify and to admit to our faults and our weaknesses and our shortcomings. To identify those areas in our lives where we need to work. Those aspects of our character that we need to change, that we need to improve. Lent's a great time to take it to the next step, which is a two-part process. To do something about these sins. Part one is to take advantage of the sacrament of reconciliation, a process through which we can receive God's forgiveness, receive God's graces and blessings. Part two of the process is determining how we can modify our lives so that we don't find ourselves back in that same situation all over again. Finding a way to clothe ourselves with Christ's incorruptibility and immortality. Quoting Ephesians, to put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. As Lent approaches, preparing yourselves to fully participate in the Lenten season. Fully participate in prayer, fasting, almsgiving. 